When I first got started in Eurorack, I had a lot of questions about what this slew thing is and why I would want to limit it. And when I got a mass, I didn't even realize at first that it was doing it. So I want to spend some time getting into it. First, I'm going to just describe it and show how it's implemented on maths. Then I'm going to show some examples of how to use it. I'm going to touch on portamento, which is often the example used to describe slew. From there, I want to talk about turning a clock into an LFO, or how you can use maths to change the harmonic content of an oscillator, or create an envelope follower and then use it for side chaining and ducking. And finally, I want to show it being used as a signal detector. If you already know all about slew limiters and maths, you can jump forward to one of these examples. But there's a lot here, and I think if you watch the first part, you still might learn something new. I certainly did while I was preparing it. The first most obvious question is, what is SLU? And the quick answer is that SLU, or more properly the SLU rate, is how quickly voltage changes from one level to another. Even in the case of a gate signal, it doesn't truly jump instantly from zero volts to 10 volts or whatever. It might only take a millionth of a second, but it does take time. That speed is the slew rate, and it's usually given in units like volts per millisecond. But especially if you're just going to be going between the same levels, like between zero volts and 10 volts, then it can be easier just to think in terms of slew time, how long it takes. When I was getting started, I used this little mnemonic, slew equals slow. If you want to transition between voltages slower than instantly, that's where a slew limiter comes in. And it's a little weird that nowhere on the maths panel does it say slew limiter, but they're there, baked into the channels one and four. They're actually pretty full featured. They allow you to dial in different slew rates for when the voltage rises and when it falls. The log X knob lets you change how the slew rate changes over time. I'm gonna go into that in depth here in a little bit. And it lets you use the attenuverters to scale or invert the voltage as it gets output. And then for the outputs, Mass actually gives you two, one that respects what you set with the attenuverter and one that outputs at unity, but we'll get into that. So here's a quick demonstration. The green trace is the incoming gate, jumping from zero to five volts almost instantly. The yellow trace is the slewed version. When the gate signal jumps up, the slew limiter slows down that transition. In this case, it's only about a fifth of a second, but that's a lot slower than the gate itself was. If you want, we can slow it down even more. Here's an example of where it takes about two seconds to change. But mass can go a lot slower than that. You can set it up so it takes a couple of minutes to complete the transition, but that would be a pretty boring video. Like I said, there are two of them on maths, and you can set them up independently. There is one little difference between the two, and we'll see that at the end of the video, but for most purposes, you can use them interchangeably. Like most things with maths, almost everything is CV controllable, though it gets a bit weird. The rise and fall CVs work one way. Put in a positive voltage, and the slew time increases, and it goes slower. Put in a negative voltage, and it gets faster. The both CV input works the opposite way. Put in a positive voltage and both the rise and fall go faster. Put in a negative voltage and it goes slower. I'm not sure why they switched up that behavior, but unless you know what's happening, it can be a little confusing. I wanna quickly come back to the whole thing about two outputs. That's another thing that's different with channels one and four in general. In addition to the regular output for the channels where the attenuverter is applied, there's also a unity output marked with what looks like a little integration symbol. I'm not sure why they picked that symbol, but on my diagrams I just write in unity for clarity. So if you have a gate that goes from 0 to 5 volts, the unity output will stay at 0 to 5 volts. But if you had the attenuverter turned all the way to the left, the regular output would also show the voltage sweeping from 0 volts down to minus 5. I'm going to do a different video about how the summing bus works. But if you take the regular output, it actually removes that voltage from the summing bus, the sum and the invert and the OR calculations. The unity outputs don't work that way, so you can use them without affecting the sum. And just one more comment about the front panel. I guess it's about time that I started talking about the Vera response, as Make Noise calls it. I just notate it log slash exp. What it's really doing is controlling the shape of the slew response over time. At about the 11 o'clock position on the dial, there's a little mark, and that's the linear setting, which means that the slew will be at about the same rate the whole time. Above that, you get into exponential territory, where the slew speeds up as it approaches the target voltage, and below that is logarithmic territory, where it slows down as it gets closer. Here's a quick example of them all at the same time. In yellow, at the top, is the incoming gate signal. Below that is linear in red, logarithmic in green, and exponential in blue. 
For most of the rest of the video, I'm just going to leave it at linear, but it's always worth tweaking this control if you're experimenting. It can add a little character. And with that, let's get on to some sample patches. Portamento is pretty much the default explanation of what SLU is, but I've already talked about it in my Maths 202 video. I wanted to come back to it though because I made a bit of a mistake. Here's the diagram I used, and you can see that I specify that you need to turn the attenuverter all the way clockwise to make sure you get the same pitch CV out as you sent in. The attenuator will reduce the pitch, so you might want to go up an octave, but if you misset it you can actually end up going down a couple of notes because you didn't pay attention. But just a minute ago I told you about the unity output, which by definition keeps the voltage at the same level. So that's the safer route for something like Portamento. But since I already did Portamento in a previous video, I want to do something a little more interesting. I'm going to take the same incoming pitch CV from a sequencer, but I'm going to process it twice separately. On channel 1, I'm going to slew the voltage as it rises, and on channel 4, I'm going to slew it as it drops. Then I'm going to run them into two oscillators that are otherwise tuned together. Then especially as the pitch changes a large amount, you can hear them diverge and come back together. This is a fairly simple one, but I'm going to build on it here in a minute. You've already seen the basics for this. Coming in in green is a repeated clock signal, and in yellow we're going to show how it changes as we tweak the controls. Turning up the rise knob, we change it from a square wave into something like a sawtooth. And then turning up the fall control turns it into a triangle. This can be a lot of fun when you use it with a clock divider, so you can have a base clock and then you can have a couple different LFOs running at related rates. Now we get into something really interesting, which is to use SLU to change the character of an oscillator. It's easy to forget that SLU works at audio rates as well, and if it can turn a clock into a triangle LFO, can it turn a square wave from an oscillator into a triangle wave? Turns out that it can. The diagram is super simple, and you've seen it before. The only real difference is that you're going to need to set the rise and fall knobs all the way down, because you need the changes to be really fast since this is audio rate. In this diagram, I'm using the attenuverter so you can turn down the volume if you need to, or invert the waveform for some interesting effects. But just like with the Portamento example, you can also use the unity output and ignore the attenuverter. So we've just seen this. It looks like the clock to LFO example. The only difference is the time scale. I'm switching over to the Spectrum Analyzer on the Mordax. Remember that for anything other than a sine wave, you're going to get not just the fundamental frequency, that's the big peak to the left, but also the harmonics, which will be at multiples of that fundamental. Another way to look at it is on the spectrograph. Here you're seeing how it changes over time. The frequencies are represented up and down, and when I change the pitch, you can see them all jumping around. So, back to the oscilloscope. In green, you can see the original square wave, and I'll turn on the other channel, and now in yellow is the waveform after going through SLU limiting. Remember that we turned the rise and fall controls all the way down, but even still, we're seeing an effect. I'm going to switch the audio from playing the square wave to the modified wave. It got quieter. Why? Well, let's look at the spectrograph again. Here's the original square wave. When we change it to show the altered wave, a bunch of those lines disappear. Those are some of those harmonics being filtered out. Did I say filtered? Yes, it's filtering out the upper harmonics and letting the lower ones pass through. In a very real way, a slew limiter can act as a low-pass filter. And when you take out the harmonics, you take energy out of the sound, and it gets quieter. But it's not strictly a low-pass filter. You can see that as I play with the fall time, one of the harmonics goes away. And as I turn up the rise, some upper ones come back. This is why I called this section harmonic munging instead of just filtering. 
So I'm starting a sequencer here, and it gets kind of interesting. The rise and fall times are fixed, but the wavelength of the waveform changes with the pitch, so you actually get slightly different waveforms, triangle waves as the pitch rises and trapezoidal ones as the pitch drops. And of course you can always play with the Berry response control to further shape that waveform. Or you can modify the slew parameters with an LFO to add sort of a pulse width modulation sound to it. Now this is really cool. Sine waves have no harmonics, they're just the pure fundamental. But sometimes you want more character than that. And here we're using slewing to add harmonics to the tone. Just in general, I find this technique a great way to make simple noise maker oscillators more interesting. You can take a sine wave generator and add harmonics, or you can take an Atari punk console or a 555 bass oscillator and add character to it. If you do something cool with it, leave a note in the comments. In the last example, I used fast slewing to subtly alter the waveform of an oscillator. But what happens if we use a longer slew time on audio? In that case, you can effectively trace out the shape of the amplitude, the loudness, and throw away all of the details of the sound. If you do that, you've got an envelope follower, and that can be really useful. In this demo, I've got rings responding to a button press. I don't know what happened to the audio with this one, but you can see that when I press the button, the output from rings is in green, bouncing up and down and fading over time, and there's our envelope in blue, following the loudness contour of the sound. Now there's a lot of neat things we can do with that. We can use it to modulate a filter on something else. We could even patch it back into rings and have the loudness of its output affect the sound as it's being produced. Or you could use it as an envelope input into a VCA and make a note from another oscillator follow the same loudness curve. When you do that, to use the audio from one source to affect something else, that's called side chaining. So here's a common use for side chaining, ducking. That's when you use one sound to drop the volume of another sound. This is particularly useful down at the lower frequencies where things can get pretty muddy between the bass line and drums and drones. They're all fighting for the same part of the frequency spectrum. This can help make a little room for it. Now it's a little weird if you haven't seen it done before, but we're going to kind of use a VCA backwards. Normally a VCA is closed and it doesn't let sound through until it gets voltage from the envelope. But in this case we're going to leave it wide open and then close it as the voltage comes in, which will have the effect of turning down the volume. I'm turning up the attenuverter for channel 2 quite a bit. That's going to be our baseline open VCA level. Then I'm going to turn the attenuverter on channel 1 all the way counterclockwise, which is going to invert the envelope. It's going to create a negative voltage that follows the shape of the sound. Add it all together, you've got a high voltage just by default, and then when the sound from rings comes in, it's subtracting that from that default voltage. Now we're going to use that to drive a VCA. Now the effect can be subtle, and it probably should be. You don't want to take a big chunk out of the sound, you just want to drop it a little bit to make room in the mix for something else.
This last one is closely related to the envelope follower, except instead of getting an envelope that follows the loudness contour of the sound, we just want a gate that says yes or no whether or not there's a signal present. If we use channel 1, then we'll use the end of rise gate output. See my Maths 201 video if you want to know more about how the EOR and EOC outputs work, but basically the end of rise gate stays low as long as the voltage is zero or rising, and then it goes high once the voltage has hit its peak, and it stays high until there's no more signal. Channel 4 doesn't have end of rise, it has end of cycle. And you take that and add the little tweak of logic that make noise is done, and it makes it work basically in reverse. The gate is going to be high as long as things are quiet, and then go low when a signal comes in. It's this second setup that I'm going to demonstrate, and I'm going to use it to do one of my favorite tricks with Mutable Instruments Clouds. Clouds lets you freeze an incoming sound in a buffer and then move around inside of it. So I'm going to use my signal detector patch to listen to a sample player. When it hears a sample being played, it's going to make the gate go low, which will turn off freeze mode and allow the audio to be recorded into the buffer. And when the sample finishes, the gate's going to go high, which will turn freeze mode back on. Then I have triple slots here that slowly moves the playhead around inside the buffer. I could do this all day. And that wraps up this look at slew limiting with maths. It turns out that slowing down voltage change can do some interesting things. If you have any favorites that I haven't covered, leave a comment and let me know what it is. And if you've watched this far, consider subscribing. Thanks for watching.